righty. And on to our fifth and final presentation of the evening, Joel Sachs and Beatrice Lujan are co-presenting -pre together. Take it away. Hi. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about some fun we've been having with habitats, some frustration we've been having with habitats. Um, Jocelyn, Beatrice, and James are all online with us. Uh, Jocelyn has to uh, split screen us because she is, as we speak, uh, leading a girl guide activity. So shout out to Ottawa's 16th girl guide troop. Um, let's see. Right, so I'll talk a little bit about the two projects that this work um, comes out of. Uh, I'll describe, I'll illustrate the problem, and then uh, Beatrice will, uh, will take over and describe some experiments that we ran this summer uh, during the, the height of our COVID stay at home. So if you've been to Tadwig before, um, you've, you might have seen us uh, describe our Floor of North America project, uh, which was built on Semantic Media Wiki. Um, the Canadian Floor Commons grows out of that. Uh, for a couple of reasons, we switched from SMW to Wikidata and the Wikidata, Wikibase rather, and the Wikidata Query Service. So basically the, the goal for the Commons is to be a dynamic flora with uh, character-based search plugged into the semantic web. So um, the pages are seeded with, with data that we already have from the, uh, from the FNA. So our, our colleague in Hong Shui has developed a tool called Care Parser that lets us extract uh, morphological data, the structures, the characters, and the character values from the semi-structured text that's in the treatments, then we, we can load that data into SMW and query on, uh, on character traits. So that, of course, supports a variety of use cases, including interactive keys, and I'm going to demonstrate that, that use case because it sort of tees up the problem that we're having with habitats. So here, we select four characters, corolla coloration, stem orientation, stem external texture, and flowering time. And you can see by the size of the, the characters in the word clouds, uh, how many taxa in the asteraceae um, have those characters. And of course, as you, um, as in, as always in faceted search, as you, uh, as you select characters, uh, the number of choices dwindles until finally here, we've selected Corolla coloration purple, stem orientation erect, stem external texture glabrous, flowering time summer, and we have seven, uh, seven hits. Uh, so wouldn't it be great to do this with, with habitats? Well, we tried and we get something very different. We get um, uh, a lot of singletons and in general, not very much reuse of, of habitat terminology. So why does that happen? Well. Um, FNA, like uh, most flora, only have a single field for habitat and inside habitat, so that, that field conflates um, geography, geology, taxonomic association, environmental condition, uh, and other habitat related uh, information. So this example shows damp soil near streams, roadsides, open pine oak woodlands and forests, you see environmental conditions, you see canopy coverage, you see taxonomic association. Uh, furthermore, the guide to authors uh, for Floor of North America is very specific about the traits that have to be, the morphological traits that need to be described, but there's hardly any editorial guidance uh, for, well, there is no editorial guidance for, for, uh, for Habitat. So, well, we work with uh, some FNA editors and we started to think, uh, maybe a future authoring tool shouldn't have a habitat field. It should have multiple habitat fields. And then we started thinking, what should those be? And we said, well, what do we want to know? We, we typically want to know uh, the, uh, the, the soil conditions, uh, the incline, canopy cover. And we, would, we, made a, we made lists of these questions we wanted to answer from the habitat descriptions. And then we iterated over the treatments in uh, over several families. 
uh, and we would have to expand our list because we would see that the author is trying to tell us things that uh, we didn't even know that we wanted to know. Uh, but after um, uh, uh, several, you know, many afternoons uh, spent uh, trying to mind read the authors uh, amongst uh, the four of us, Beatrice, Jocelyn, James, and myself, uh, we came up with a, you know, a, a putative ontology. Uh, and uh, then we, we realized that it might not be that, that, that the answers that we came to in those arguments might not be the same conclusions that others come to. Uh, and so that led us to the experiments that Beatrice is going to describe. Okay, so hopefully you can hear me. In step one of this work, we developed this simple habitat ontology after examining over 3,000 habitat descriptions across multiple plant families. And the ontology is composed of 12 habitat classes. So you can see it now on the screen. The first five make use of a controlled vocabulary, and two of them have subclasses. And so the next step was to annotate the legacy habitat descriptions with the terms of in the ontology. And so going back to the previous example, damp soils near streams, roadsides, open pine oak woodlands and forests would get annotated with our ontology as moisture wet, canopy coverage open, along transitways, near body of water, substrate composition soil, taxonomic association pine oak, and plant community woodlands and forests. So these are some word clouds of the habitat terms that informed us to create uh, each class. And in the process of developing this ontology, we spend many hours, as Joel said, discussing whether to add or remove a new class. And we wanted to know if our ontology would be consistently applied and if our definitions were clear. So we basically uh, wanted to validate this ontology. And so given our currently working from home situation, some of our coworkers in our research center have a limited amount of work that they can do from home. And we thought maybe we can recruit volunteers to help us achieve this part of the project. So we recruited a team of volunteers and taught them how to annotate habitat descriptions using Web Protege. So there's a screenshot here of how this would be done. And since we wanted to validate our ontology, we divided the volunteers into two groups and with each group working with the same data set so that we can compare results. And to our surprise, our simple habitat ontology was hard to use. This graph shows the number of shared and unique annotations per habitat ontology class. And as you can see, there, are, there was little consensus among the two groups, and there's a large number of unique annotations in almost every class. Two minutes. This scatter plot shows the number of annotations that were made by each group. And in the orange line, uh, this is a one-to-one -one line. So if the annotations are the same between group A and B, um, they would fall on the line. So you can clearly see that group B made more annotations in most classes than group A. And after volunteers had annotated the habitat descriptions, we had discussions to try to understand why there was little consensus between the two groups. And we realized that the two groups had different approaches. Uh, so group B tried to capture everything that the author may have wanted to express, while group A used a less is more approach and didn't try to read too much into the habitat descriptions. And so after having more discussions with the volunteers, we made some edits to our ontology classes and class definitions. And we performed some definition tests using Zoom polls. And we were asking questions like, after our discussion, would you annotate this term with this class? And people had two options to either annotate it or not. And this graph shows a breakdown of the test responses. And uh, for example, from 62 tests that were done, only 26 of them uh, had 100% agreement. So that's the last bar on the right. And going back to the shared and unique annotations, uh, this graph shows that about half of our classes get 50% or less shared annotations. So even after group discussions on the refinement of our definitions, the terms were still inconsistently applied. 
So our hope is that we can provide a strong enough guidance to overcome this. And if not, we might have to limit our ontology to the terms that were used consistently. And so for the next step, uh, our habitat work had two main goals. And the first one was to provide a semantic structure to legacy habitat descriptions. So we know, now have done that for four out of the 20 FNA volumes. And I will show something uh, exciting about this, uh, what we can do with this data in the next two slides. And the second goal was to provide a template for future habitat descriptions, as Joel mentioned. So for the upcoming FNA volumes that are in development, we hope that our ontology can be used um, to provide structured habitat descriptions. And so after all this work, we realized that even simple ontologies are hard to use. And we are still thinking about how we're going to move forward. So if any of you here would like to participate in future discussions or habitat ontology experiments, please let us know in the Google Doc for this session by adding your name and email. And so at the beginning of the talk, we said that we have this new project, um, the Canadian Flora Commons. And one of the functionalities that we have in demo system at this point is a morphology search interface where a user can query for plants based on a structure, a character, and character value. So in this example here, we've searched for the plants that have um, white flowers. And the idea is that with this work, uh, we can now develop a similar search interface uh, but for habitat, where you can search for plants that in this example, uh, grow in a wet and open habitat. So uh, thank you all for listening. And we also wanted to thank uh, everyone that participated in this project. Thank you. Great job. Thank you so much, Joel and Beatrice. I think we actually already have a couple questions from uh, from the audience. Uh, the first is from Abby Benson. Is this a place where things like the US National Vegetation Classification Standard or the Coastal and Marine Ecological Classification Standard might help? Possibly. It's it's some time since I looked at those. Um, they're, they're, they're enormous, if I recall. Um, but so, would they help? I'm not sure. Uh, could we map some of our terms to terms in those uh, classifications? Uh, uh, probably. And mm, I, 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 I don't know. I don't know if they would help. We'll, 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 we'll take another look uh, uh, as, we, as we continue to, uh, you know, to work on this. Great. Uh, the next question, do you have examples of which terms were consistently, were used consistently and which were not? Beatrice, do you remember? Um, it, terms were often used consistently within a group as, as Beatrice was, was saying that, that that the groups had different philosophies in terms of how much they had, you know, knowledge they would try to, or how much mind reading they would try to do. Um, so uh, I think the, the, the um, disturbance uh, is near the top, uh, canopy coverage. Um, I'll take a look. Yeah, I, I can't think of a... Uh... Taxonomic association uh, was the most consistently applied, then along transit ways, substrate type, uh, near body of water, disturbant, disturbance, uh, environmental conditions like moisture. Um, terms like plant community were seen as more, more vague and, and, and less consistently applied. Okay, great. Let's see, next question from Paula. When thinking 
of people sharing habitat info using Darwin Core. The current definition of the term says a category or description of dot dot dot. If we are telling people to provide a description, we should not expect them to fill in with a controlled vocabulary, correct? So, yes, correct. Um, habitat, but what we're, I guess, proposing, um, not necessarily for, for Darwin Core, but for, uh, for taxonomic treatments is to have uh, multiple fields, uh, some of which would be valued by control vocabularies and, and others which would still be, um, which would still be open. Um, in terms of annotating the legacy data, uh, we would maintain, of course, the verbatim habitat uh, description. Does that answer uh, your question, Paula? Yeah, thanks. So, yeah, my, my question was may, maybe to think of whether we should review the, the definition of the term. So, yeah, it's perfect, your answer. Thank you. <laughs> and I'm muted. Sorry about that. So, Paula's next question was, did you find any case where you had to deal with different languages? And if so, how did you deal with it? Um, yeah, so in, in this case, we were working only with Flora of North America data and everything was in English, so we didn't have that issue. Um, but I can imagine it would add just uh, another layer of difficulty. Yeah, I mean, the flip side of this, we're, we're at the taxon level. So these are, these are you know, taxon wide descriptions where, what conditions might these tax exist in. But the flip side of that is the specimen level where specifically what was the habitat where this was collected. Um, and uh, that's where, um, well, even in our own herbarium in, in Ottawa, of course, dominated by English and French, but uh, the people who are, who are working on, on digitizing the labels are often running into uh, other languages as well. But we have not yet had the pleasure of uh, uh, dealing with that problem. Um, all right, let's see. The next question is, would exposing these clusters of terms to broader audiences be a way to help the community coalesce in the future around consensus, consensus terms? It's easy for you to create these, these word clouds you showed, but they're not available um, on click at an, at an aggregator, for example. I guess yes. Uh, uh, you know, our our next our, our our you know current outreach, I guess, is to the broader uh, Floor of North America editorial board beyond the small group that we had been uh, working with, um, and you guys, um, and uh, possibly via uh, a Trees of North America project. Uh, uh, that the uh, U.S. Botanical Garden is uh, is um, sponsoring and and facilitating, I guess. Great. We have time for another question or two from uh, from Joel and Beatrice. If you have if you have questions, otherwise, I think at this point we could potentially open the floor up for questions and discussion with all of our speakers from today. Let's see if anybody has, in the audience has any lingering questions, concerns, comments they wanna add. Feel free to go ahead and unmute yourself if you have something. Uh, th this is Dave Shorthouse speaking. I have a question for Lee. 
Um, so I, I'm curious about whether or not um, that whole data quality interest group has uh, thought about this notion of there being um, uh, errors in linkages made between different entities and whether or not that fits within the data quality interest group uh, and tests and assertions. So it's not merely the entities and the metadata associated with them, but a link between one entity and another. How could you design a test that might assert that a link is wrong? Mm, good question, David, and the answer is no. Um, at least not that I'm aware of. It hasn't come up specifically. I don't know if Arthur, John, Paula, or Paul want to say anything about that. It's certainly a valid question, that's for sure. David, most of, all our tests are single field tests at the moment and not multi-field tests. Uh, we did start off with a lot of multi-field tests and, and reduced that to only the single field. No, it's not totally true, Arthur. Um, if you look at the um, the terms that are actually targeting That's or right. being used in the test, there are multiples. There are definitely multiples yeah, against most we of them. Do. Yeah, we do have internal consistencies. Yeah, uh, we do, but we don't. We're not testing any. Um, we're only looking at stuff within the record. The record is the totality. If there are any links going outside that, as far as I'm aware, yeah. no, we have not dealt with that. So I, I guess Other another, than the way looking, yeah, another way of looking at that is oftentimes it's very useful to draw in some metadata uh, from external to the record, you know, such as birth dates, death dates. You, know, you can imagine all kinds of extraneous bits of metadata that would really help to test whether or not, uh, you, know, you know, dates are a good example, an easy one, but whether or not um, um, the value is uh, illogical. Yeah, uh, look, I think it, uh, John might want to comment on this, but we have a total dependency upon Darwin Core. That has both been a good thing that limits the scope to what we're doing, but as we found out very early on, of course, the open-ended nature of Darwin Core is itself one of the major problems of detecting, evaluating fitness for purpose. John, do you want to say anything about that? Maybe sitting again? <laughs> Paul might want to say something about the date type example. We've got a lot of tests on on dates, for example. I'm, I meant single record rather than single field before. Um, and we've looked at whether the, the date makes sense in a lot of in a lot of ways. Um, but dates is fairly complicated. It's a lot more complicated than what we thought would be originally. Uh, but if Paul's around, he might want to comment on that. Yeah, I mean, the one thing I'd say until if Paul comes online would be that we certainly are checking internal consistency upon a record, but as far as I'm aware, the only external stuff is when we're hitting the source authority uh, that we'd be able to check the values for a Darwin core term. I do not see Paul on the list of participants. So I don't think he's in the call right now. No, Paul, Paul's left us. His, his uh, bandwidth is fairly narrow at times. Um, what was I going to say? The, the, there are a lot of other tests, supplementary tests, that we decided were far too difficult for us to deal with at, at the moment. And we've put those aside. If somebody wants to take those up, um, I'm not sure that the current group is going to want to do that after the time we've we've spent on these on the core, but there are a lot of what we call supplementary tests that look at a whole range of different things out uh, looking at external and internal and, and other fields that we just believe weren't core at the time. Um, I wonder if I could chime in. Uh, this is Mark from Belgium. Um, and, and I might be totally off topic here. So if I am, consider it as, as an example of thinking out of the box, right? Uh, but uh, in David's question, I hear linking. So I immediately I'm thinking about uh, linked data, RDF. And in that realm, uh, and, and I, I had that question also uh, pointing to, to Marcos earlier, 
the usage of shackle, the shape constraint language, really allows for uh, validation on uh, possible links. Although it, 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 it is always uh, based on structural stuff, right? You, you could have expressions saying, uh, you cannot have two uh, fathers to one child. So whenever you have two links like that, the system will, will, uh, will be able to detect that it's an error. That's a logical error. error. A similar uh, error could be uh, raised by declaring that a link of a certain semantic value could not be uh, pointing to itself. You cannot be your own father, stuff like that. So uh, still it's, it's limited, not to topical facts, so to, 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 to instances, only to structures, but that could be a line of thinking. And I, I, again, I might be completely off, but it might be a, a way of thinking to constrain, validate and check on uh, structural information and in knowledge graphs in general. Okay, I think John wanted to talk. John, did you want to join join in on the conversation? Come here. Want me to unmute you here? Only if I can get a recap of the question. I wasn't able to hear the question. I just heard that. John, do you have a comment? <laughs> David, do you want to repeat it? Uh... I'll try. You know, I've got too many things happening at once with kids trying to go to bed. Um, so um, my question is, in thinking about the, the data quality interest group and the tests and assertions, um, we've made, we've heard that um, most of these, if not all of them, deal with um, the terms that are kind of in, in isolation within, within the Darwin court, you know, record itself. Um, but what about tests and assertions that might um, um, be reliant upon links to other entities that might inform whether or not values are uh, valid or logical or illogical? Has there been any additional work in thinking about how to do tests and assertions based on linkages to external entities? I suspect what you mean is deeper than a reliance on source authorities vocabularies or folksonomies to try to find standard values for terms that are in the wild. Is that right? Yes, I think possibly, yeah. Um, so, you know, in, in addition to just the test and assertions within Darren Court itself, I mean, there's a whole, you know, there's clearly going to be a need for detecting whether or not a link between one entity and another is illogical or incorrect, you know, especially when we start thinking of digital specimens and that whole space. Um, and you know, not all links are going to be correct um, from one entity to another. And how do you detect that? And whether or not it's even possible to think about it in uh, the data quality interest group. It sounds like a for some strange people like ourselves, a fun space to get into. But no, we didn't think on those terms. I think Lee mentioned that we tried to scope the, this basic set. And it turned out to be more than 100 tests when we started on Darwin core terms with the justification that at least we have a solid definition to work from and semi-solid recommendations of where the values ought to come from. But this is a different level that you're talking about and sounds like a super interesting one where a lot of the things that were talked about in this symposium could come to bear. It might be interesting for anybody who wants to follow up on that kind of idea to, to come up with a use case and see if we can't style a, a new kind of test and assertion based on linkages, the way you're talking about. One thing I would say to put it in perspective is that we've got one hell of a lot of problem regarding not being able to nail down adequately the vocabularies associated with the Darwin core terms, hence Paula's project on TG4. That is probably the major limitation at the moment. Um, what you're talking about is above and beyond that. So what I would say is the priority at the moment where we really need some help is to nail down those vocabs. 
David, I think what you're talking about would be another task group entirely under the interest group, but it certainly does fall within the purview of the uh, data quality interest group. But I think, um, as John just said, it, it's, it's broader and would probably need a, another dedicated task group to look at some of that, those aspects. I would be yeah. happy to join one if there was such a one. I think uh, Jorit had a, a comment to add to the discussion. Yeah, I just wanted to share uh, some of the uh, work that I've done with uh, Encyclopedia of Life, in which we actually do something uh, like uh, David that uh, is sort of alluding to. So we found that um, it was very, very nice to be able to publish or what Encyclopedia of Life does is they, they have a set of rules that basically uh, validates uh, certain interactions that they index from Globy. So for instance, un, un, unexpected things like, um, um, you know, um, plants visiting the flowers of animals. Uh, and then what they do is they publish a data set out of that, a refutation data set that is then fed back into Globy. So that is also a way not just to validate the data, but to have a uh, to have Encyclopedia of Life say give their perspective on the quality of Globy's data. So you can layer more than one perspective on top of that, and that has been fairly successful. It's not uh, standardized in any way, but it's one example that uh, might be might be instructive to start thinking more uh, systematically about links and the validity of links. Great, great, thanks. Uh, Deb, did you wanna add on to that as well? No, I'm just, I'm following. I, in, in my mind, it's like a kind of annotation, but I, I was thinking in the, in the genealogy world, the sort of manual method here is, if I'm searching something and it says, a is the parent of B, or this is a sibling of so-and-so, and I know that it's not. Um, I know that at one point this wasn't true, but in the genealogy world now, at least at one point in Ancestry, you could actually assert something without even logging in. They would let you say, this is wrong, and then this is why. And they would take that data. Now, what they do with it on the back end and how they do it, but they do allow you to share that you know something is incorrect and then say why you know that is incorrect. So they, I, I was started to be thinking about from an annotation point of view because we keep coming across this hypothesis software and thinking about how humans and automation could work together. Seeing that Paul isn't here, it's just worth a mention. I did state that there was a dependency on the outcome of TG2 on the work of the of Paul's annotation group. But just to give everyone a little bit of an idea about that is that we anticipated that the outcomes of the tests and assertions would be implemented as annotations that went with the record wherever it went. Obviously, that is a major limitation at the moment. We do not have a system to do it. And as Paul lovely likes to Paul to point out, you can have annotations upon annotations upon annotations. Um, it does get complex. And I think the outcome, as far as I'm aware, of that group was that we would support W3C annotation standards. Any other comments, concerns to add? I think the uh, the ultimate outcome seems to be the recommendation by Arthur to start another uh, Tadwig task group on the topic, as there will soon be some availability for <laughs> for people to, to volunteer to do such. All right, we've got. I think we've got about five minutes left. If anybody has any other questions, comments to bring up. No. 
I don't hear any uh, cartoon crickets, but I kind of feel like that might be what's there right now. <laughs> if there are no other questions or you know, no other comments from everybody, then why don't we go ahead and, and wrap this up. This has been an amazing session. Thank you so much to all of our speakers for your time, for your insight, for leading all of these discussions. And thank you to all of the attendees um, tonight for me, to, uh, today in general, wherever, wherever you are, what time it is. Thank you for your attention and for your, your great questions and interactions. Um, our next session will be Thursday at 11 a.m. UTC. So hopefully you will join us there. Um, I don't write down which session it is, sorry. Um, but yeah, hopefully everybody's gonna be there and have a lovely rest of your day. Thank you so much, everybody.